Hi guys! We're Miss Johnson's cousins. My name is Emma. I'm in college and I major in elementary education. And my name is Grace and I'm a sophomore in high school. Today we're going to be reading chapters 15 and 16 for you guys. And don't forget to get your orange booklets out. I'm going to remind you of what happened in chapter 13. So Anton came back to his bubby, which remember is his grandma. His uncle Dimitri came back to the cave and told everyone that German soldiers had almost captured them and said that everyone needs to be careful from now on. And then I'm going to remind you guys what happened in chapter 14, which is the people in the cave were getting low on food and water. So as the man, men were getting ready to go out and seek things for everyone, Major Von Dusen and his crew found the cave. They took Bubby, Rena, and Rena's son David. Anton was hiding from the men. So now I'm going to read you guys chapter 15. Anton waited until the cavern was empty watching the major and four of his men take Bubby, Rena, and David away had been excruciating. He wondered if the Gestapo, Gestapo had a vehicle on the surface to carry Bubby away or if they would make her take the long walk to the nearest road. The other soldiers split up into groups of two and disappeared, heading in every direction to search the cavern's many tunnels. He hoped they wouldn't spot the markers he and Daniel had drawn. After a few long moments, Anton crawled out from the, his hiding place as quickly as he could. He strung his blanket bag over his shoulder and crept silently to the tunnel entrance. He did not dare use a lantern or flashlight. Pausing, he listened for the sound of retreating soldiers. When he was certain he was alone, he scurried up the tunnel to the cave's entrance. The starlight was a welcome sight but he couldn't dally there. Here, he had to find Bubby. The view in front of him was pockmarked with boulders and far too rocky for a vehicle to get close. But off to the east towards the river, he heard the sound of an engine. He studied the surrounding terrain. There was no soldiers in sight. As quickly as he could, he darted in the direction of the revving engine, using the boulders for cover. Several meters away, he spotted a half track idling along the riverbank. In the distance, he could see Bubby and Rena being loaded roughly in the back of a gray metal military vehicle. The giant black swastika painted on its side a grim reminder of the monsters who controlled their fate. The half-track pulled away and traveled slowly along the river. Anton broke into a run. They would not be able to drive at full speed until they reached the nearest road. He should be able to keep up with them. Perhaps, if he could get ahead of them, he could find a way to stop the vehicle. If he could get the Germans to abandon it and force them to walk, he'd have a better chance of freeing Bubby. It was risky, and it wasn't even a plan. Not really. But it was the only thing he could think of. He wished Uncle Dimitri were with him. He would know what to do. The Major had said the prisoners were being taken to Borda, to be interrogated. Borda was many kilometers from the cave. He would need to stop them before they reached it. Taking one last look to be sure no other Gestapo were about, Anton sprinted from the cover of the rocks and followed the half track into the night. His ribs were still sore and each step sent a little jolt of pain through his side, but he pushed it from his mind. He would follow them and find a way to get Bubby back, Rena and her son too. He would get them all back. As he ran along, he wondered what happened to the rest of the group. How would they get to Priest Grotto? If his half a plan was successful, how would they catch up? One thing at a time, Anton said to himself. The ground was rough, and he stumbled several times as he ran, but he managed to keep the half track in sight. He wished he could use the flashlight he'd stashed in his bag, but he couldn't risk it. He tripped over a rock and fell headlong onto the hard ground, scraping his hands and knees. It felt as if a knife had been driven into his ribs. He wanted to cry out in pain, but would not allow himself. He took a moment to catch his breath and then clambered to his feet and got back to running after the half track. They had now reached the potato fields that ran along the river bottom. Soon the half track would reach the road. When that happened, he would no longer be able to keep up, but he had an idea. They would have to drive north on the road until it joined a larger one that led directly to Borda. If he cut around the field, he would intercept them. Anton turned and ran. He kept keeping the half-track on his left, his breath caught 
as it disappeared behind some trees. So he pushed himself harder, cutting diagonally across the field. As the half track emerged from behind the trees, it slowed. A bright searchlight from its roof cut through the night. Anton assumed they might be looking for, for other members of his party. The half track crawled slowly along the road now. This was his chance. He knew that the searchlight could find him, so he sped up, charging through the field as his legs could carry him. He had no idea he would stop them, but he had to try. When he reached the edge of the field, he noticed a small shed. The potato farmer who owned it, it would keep his equipment there. If Anton could get inside, he might find... <laughs> Miss Johnson, it's first time you're not go. Keep going. We're going to have to cut that out. It's fine. It's funny. <laughs> he might find something he could use to stop the half track. But when he ran around the small shed to the door, his heart sank. It was pedal locked shut. Anton examined the lock. It was old and rusty. He dropped his hands. Thanks, Miss Johnson. <laughs> he dropped his hands and knees and felt around until he found a rock the size of his fist. He worried about the noise he was, he was about to make, but there was no time to dwell on it. He smashed the rock against the lock. It held. Again, he swung, and again the lock would not budge. The third time, he raised his arm high over the, his head and brought the rock down to the lock. It broke open. Scrambling inside the shed, he pulled the door closed, grabbed the flashlight from his pack, and flicked it on. He found a treasure trove. There were shovels and hoes and scythes. The walls were lined with hammers and wrenches, but he couldn't see anything that might help him stop the half track. Shining the light into the corners of windowless shed, he saw a shelf on the back wall that had held several cans. He pulled each one off and examined the contents. They held nuts and bolt, bolts and other small hardware. The last can, can was the biggest. It was heavy. When he looked inside, he nearly leapt for joy. It was full of rusty nails, hundreds of them, and they gave him a very good idea. He tucked the can under his arm, raced out of the shed, and headed for the road. So that is chapter four, 15. And remember to get your orange booklets out, pause the video, and write down a title for this chapter. Okay, and now I'm going to read chapter 16. Okay. Major von Dusen could not have been happier. He had found where the Jews were hiding. He was returning with the prisoners, and he had no doubt his men would collect more. He had rooted them out, and now the Jews are covering, cowering like rats. He looked at the old woman sitting on the floor of the half-track's bed. She had done her best to insult him, to be little the fewer. He looked, forward, he looked forward to her interrogation. They would see how proud she was of them. Her foolish resistance would not stand against the might of the Gestapo. The other woman was young and strong, and would likely to be sent to one of the Reich's fa factories. She would work long hours sewing uniforms or operating machines to build bombs or bullets. When she had been worked to exhaustion, they would send her to one of his camps. He had no idea what would happen to her child. He did not, he did not care. But he did care about reaching the road. The half-track bumped over the rocky ground, turning into the major's stomach. They traveled slowly through the fields until finally they reached the road, where the ride smoothed out. When the engine quieted, he could hear the old woman muttering curses under her breath. He kicked her hard in the leg. What's the matter, Jude? He snarled. Do you have nothing to say now that you are a prisoner? Now that you are the property of the right? The old woman spat on him. Spittle flew from her mouth and landed on his boots. He raised his hand to strike her, but he stopped when he saw she was not afraid and stared at him with complete defiance. That was what she wanted. She would take his beatings if it meant distracting him from learning about the rest of the hidden Jews. She would not, he would not give her satisfaction, yet, but eventually she would fold. Everyone had a breaking point. Curse it all you want, old woman, he said. Praise your God. Nothing is going to help you now. To his surprise, the old woman studied him for what seemed like several minutes. Ooh. Sorry. His eyes narrowed down and her brow furrowed before she finally spoke. You can't hide it, she told him. 
The expression on her face changed from one concentration to a device sneer. Hide what? Your fear. Von Dusen threw back his head and laughed. The old woman glared as she reached over to the young woman and pulled her child and placed her arm around him. My fear, he said. You believe I'm afraid of two women and a child? Are you insane? No, you are not afraid of me. You are a bully and a coward. You are not afraid of a tired old woman. You, Herr Major, are, you, are afraid of losing? Losing? Losing what? Trust me, old woman. I will not lose you. And if you try to escape, I will not hesitate to shoot you down like a dog. Now it was the old woman's turn to throw back her head and laugh. You Germans, such zealots, so self-righteous. You are nothing more than the puppets of a madman, and you cannot see the truth, even when it is right before your eyes. And what truth would that be? You are losing. Your kind always loses. What great failure is befalling the Reich, Jude? Your fear drips off of you. You are losing the war. You know it. Your future knows it. You, he sends you out to gather up the Jews. You think us weak and simple, but we know things. The Americans have joined the British, and soon they will gather their forces. In the east, the Russian army chases you back to Ryland with your tails between your legs. And with the Americans coming from the west, which is where is the mighty Reich, right in the middle, waiting to be squashed like a bug. And yet your mighty fewer waste his time and resources, rounding up poor peasants and farmers. Does this make sense to you, Herr Major? Shouldn't the fewer be readying himself for the storm that is about to descend upon him? Would that not be a better plan? Ha! I give you credit, old woman. You are not afraid to speak your mind. His eyes narrowed. Perhaps I should take you to the fewer himself so he can listen to you tell him how to fight a war. Perhaps you should. The Reich will not be defeated. Do not worry, Jew. You will not live to see a free day again. The Fuhrer will smash the Americans and the British, and your mighty Russian army has been reduced to women, children, and feeble old men. They will never reach the Rhineland. When the time is right, we will crush them. The old men raised their hand. Of course. It works so well for you in Stalingrad. <laughs> the Russians are not fighting with their strongest men, and so you cannot conquer them. And then there are the Americans. You think they will ever stop until you are defeated? They have millions of men to send. Millions. How many much does the Reich have left? A few hundred thousand? How long before you mighty Gestapo's in shambles? Do not lie to me, Herr Major. Your eyes give you the way. For reasons he did not understand, this bent being old woman, with her walking stick and her peasant clothes and her wrinkled face, had unnerved him. How does she know so much about the humiliation of the Reich had suffered against the communist pigs in Russia? The Reich had been driven out of Africa. The Americans were on the march in Italy, gaining more and more ground. How could she know that the fewer was desperately sending reinforcements to the French coast, building bunkers and gun emplacements as he waited for the imminent invasion? Before he could answer, the half track slowed. Sergeant L. Eberhardt turned on the searchlight and swept it across the road in front of him. What is it, Sergeant? he asked. I'm not sure, my Major. Perhaps nothing? I thought I spotted something on the road ahead. Perhaps it is one of the Jews from the cave. Stop the truck. Turn off the engine, he ordered, pulling the Luger from the holster on his belt. He used the machine gun when necessary, but nothing felt as good as the weight of his trusty pistol in his hand. The beam of the light danced over the road ahead and into the fields on the other side. Perhaps this time you will catch an infant. Shut up, Jude, or you will regret it. Unafraid of Von Dusen's threat, the old woman staggered to her feet and shouted, If you are out there, go to the shadows. This will not find a blow to her face knocked her on the floor of the half drug. The young woman screamed and her son began to wail. Von Dusen pointed his pistol at them. Silence. Silence now, or the boy dies. She grabbed her son and pulled him tightly against her chest. She quietly pleaded with him to quiet. He buried his face in the coast as the old woman moaned the pain. Ahead. Slowly, Von Deuce in order. The driver restarted the half track, and now it crawled on the, along the road. The spotlight swept back and forth, searching for any sign of life. There was nothing to see. After a short distance, Von Deuce in order the driver to speed up. Perhaps you saw an animal, Sergeant, said Von Deuce in, or maybe the shadows are playing tricks on your eyes. My major, I think I saw... He did not get a chance to finish. Both of the front tires on the half track exploded with a loud bang. <laughs> the vehicle swerved, tossing the men about. The driver fought for control and lost as the half track carnied off the road and into the field. It skidded to a stop and began to sink into the muddy ground. A cliffhanger!
Okay, so pause this video and then begin to write a chapter title in your orange booklet. And then after you guys have finished that, you're going to go into Google Classroom and read the question that Ms. Johnson posted and then answer that question so she knows that you watched this video and listened to both of the chapters from us. Have a good weekend, guys. And finish strong because summer's almost here, so you're doing a good job. Bye, Bye. guys!